This is Henry Chamberlain. Welcome to another edition of Comics Grinder. I've got Zach acquaintance with me. He's a, a reviews editor at The Beat with uh, Heidi McDonald. And uh, we're going to be talking about, I've got some notes, and basically I have notes to uh, keep track of, of uh, all the credits, because I want to give credit where credit is due for this amazing anthology, The Death of Comics Bookcase. Zach, uh, thanks so much for, for uh, willing to, to take part in this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about the book now that it's it's finished and out and everything. Okay, so now we have uh, the uh, actual uh, deluxe edition cover here, Death of Comics Bookcase Volume 1, and it'll allow me to show some of the extras. And I have my notes here, so I want to, like I said, I wanted to try to give credit where credit is due. This is, uh, we're starting with the intro section, and uh, it's artist uh, Ryan Lee. Yeah. And I love Ryan Lee's work. It's, in, it's just so distinctive. I mean, the the way that he smells go and it, I can I imagine he probably does some children's book stuff. If he doesn't, he should because he's he's so expressive. Yeah, he's really great with drawing young people, um, which I think is not the easiest thing. I mean, he does it really well. Yeah. And then we, we segue seamlessly into the first story very different uh vibe very different color scheme and this is a uh, artist uh, anna anna reedman who actually i guess helped with the writing or, or helped with the story development could you maybe say something about that yeah i mean we co-created this together um the she, what she really helped with was the character designs and sort of the tone to it was a lot contributed um by her and um, the the pulpy tone, really, like as you'll see here, like we really went kind of over the top with a lot of it, um, and that that was Anna's doing. And now I can take advantage of the fact that, that we got to enjoy a, a, a nice chat, Jennifer and I, and, and you, and you were telling me about uh, your early years as a cub reporter. Right, I don't, I don't know what the right term would be, but just a reporter, let's say. Yeah. So there's some of that background in, in this story, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, right out of college, I, yeah, cub reporter is what you would, the old term for it. Uh, I was hired to cover the night cops beat at the Monitor in McAllen, Texas, which is about uh, three and a half, four hours south of uh, San Antonio on the border with Mexico. Um, and I was just kind of in way over my head trying to cover a very, uh, uh, active um, news area for a, a newspaper a community newspaper that was like sort of on its last legs um and so like i was overwhelmed being new to it the paper was no longer like sort of valued institution it used to be and the whole thing just kind of you know it has this if you love um horror movies it, it definitely had a, a bit of that vibe to it and that's a lot of what inspired um this first short you know move on to the next one and feel free if there's something I, i'm missing or should i mean i love this werewolf yeah that's yeah. Our, our werewolf priest character um it's actually based on a a real feature very loosely based on a real feature story i wrote about a priest who adopted 20 some dogs and had them living in his rectory a uh, human priest not a werewolf but, <laughs> but his his connection and his like love of dogs and how they would follow him up the uh the altar to mass and sit at the altar as he said mass and I was just uh, a lot of interesting people like that um that i'd written features about really stuck with me but this one seemed um something about a werewolf priest together really kind of gets a reaction from people <laughs> you know when you start mentioning that yeah it's it's, it's very memorable the, the just the words go well together yeah and it's i think very, it's if you're, gonna go funny and over the top with it like there's a, we can, you can be a little cheeky with that yeah you could not make t-shirts or, or something yeah that's an idea definitely well it's very iconic and uh, moving right on to speaking of iconic work uh, nick hagnetti just uh, hits it out of the ballpark 
with this, yeah, Nick's fun, amazing. this fun style of his. And I, I told him, I, I kind of think of him as an indie cartoonist, but he's not. He's really, he's, he's a professional mainstream uh, a cartoonist, but uh, he, he can be thought of a bit of as, as an indie guy because he does everything except uh, for the lettering, which Francois Vignat helps tremendously with. I, I, I know he has a, a really magic touch with lettering, but... I mean, maybe in the long run, Nick will do the lettering too. But it, it's a time-consuming job, as as uh, I've come to see, because you've got you've, you've got everyone, you've got a, 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 just a dream team of, of, of talent here. You got. I'm used to being being with people who do it all themselves. It's a small group of people, indie cartoonists, but uh, it really it does help to have somebody who's in charge of the lettering, have somebody who's in charge of the coloring. But again, in Nick's, in Nick's case, he uh, his art I think is so uh, intertwined with with his line work and his color choices. Maybe you, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, he um, of the of the artists I work with for the book, he's the, actually the only one who colors himself. Um, and I mean, he'd come right sort of recently. It had a really uh i guess you could call it like a breakout uh book almost with with pink lemonade yeah uh, yeah where, and where he'd done all, all the coloring and everything and francois had actually lettered that as well and i mean i just um he was eager to color himself here and and i remember like i'll say like when the colors first came back i found them surprising like i don't know what i expected but i thought he was he did some really bold um, sort of different things with the way he colored himself on this one. Like it, it felt a little more experimental almost um, mm -hmm. or just kind of different than his work that I'd seen before. And I, I absolutely love it. Like I think the story's all the better for some of the, the risks he takes with the colors here, like uh, really brings a lot to it. And I'll, I'll move along. Because I also wanted to chat with you a little bit about the whole art of writing a uh, comics review, but I want to I want to just uh, keep on this pace we're on. And here, there's a, uh, I always go back to the comics bookcase, and the, the possessed bookcase uh, narrates a little bit, and then introduces the next story. And the next story here is this gold mask. It's a wizard versus wizard, and um, th this one I, I I'm not as strong with fantasy work so it took me a little while to get into it but it, it's so funny too and it uh i stopped and thought about it and this is like a, a classic mad magazine satire on on, <laughs> on fantasy i think yeah and it's i don't know if you've ever read terry pratchett at all i think there's a lot of terry pratchett in it but it's definitely a uh um satire is a good word for it uh and a lot of people read it like well i don't usually like fantasy but this kind of plays with some of the things i don't like about it which i i took as a compliment to hear people say that um but yeah this this one i i wrote um if the first two i kind of wrote this whole book sequentially like i didn't make the, any of these shorts out of order like i, I kind of wrote it from page one to 48 and uh the first two stories were a lot heavier on caption captioning and i just wanted a back and forth between two characters and that's a lot of what um this one was kind of kind of came out of, and I Luke Horseman's the artist who drew these character designs, and I just absolutely love like like you'll see right here how expressive he makes the the mask, <laughs> the gold mask that gold mask wears. Yeah, uh, it just crack got, cracks me up. Um, the facial, yeah, that one as well. And yeah, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it, it's interesting because when we think of the general public. The potential readership out there, the general public, they can be so, uh, I don't know what the word would be, mischievous. You just don't know what they're going to be attracted to. And so when the general reader hears science fiction that they may say, well, I don't know about that, but it depends on the re on the writer. It's all about the, who's, who's writing the science fiction, who's writing the fantasy. Yeah, it was really interesting sort of promoting this because I, yeah, I'd be, there was really no telling what, people would react to it and i do think you're right like um people like it's really hard to guess why someone's supporting a, 
a Kickstarter, but I, I think there were people that liked the genres, like the artists, like Nick had, Nick had a lot of fans, I think kind of get on board with this. And um, yeah, I, I'd be, I'd, I kind of doled out the character designs as I was promoting the Kickstarter and pre-launch. And it was really interesting to see like which, who responded to which characters and what, what got more attention. I couldn't predict it at all. Like it was almost impossible for me to kind of figure out how people were responding to it. And that brings us to this uh, completely different, uh, it's a completely different vibe. This is uh I guess what would we call this? Things I think a little bit of our crumb. I think it's a crunchy, weird uh, slice of life, uh, over the top. And uh, thanks to my doing a little bit of extra research last night, I a, a light bulb went off above my head. I, I didn't realize how important it would be to to, to read the first story next door. And so I got a I got a copy of it, and you can find it. Just just Google it. And so it's fun to, to see a continuation of this uh, grumpy old man conspiracy <laughs> theory uh, fueled uh, dude. Just yeah, like, thank you for checking that out. By the way, I was that was kind of my hope with including this one that more people would go uh, read the first comic, which um, I was proud of. Yeah, and uh, yeah, my hats off to Pat Scott because he's created this really distinctive character. Yeah, Pat's great. Yeah, um, he's this guy where we um, Pat lives in Northern California, and I I've lived in Northern California a bit, and this is kind of based on um, a very specific type of older guy you kind of see in a. But I I would often encounter in the laundromat at, in downtown Sacramento so <laughs> these guys who wanted to tell me what they knew about things, and I just I would they would come up to me, and I would never know what direction it was going to go. It could be a vitamin recommendation, it could be something about rents like it i just it was always super unpredictable and i always sort of enjoyed that character oh yeah well i'm totally with you on that because I, I used to work at a community center and what i was always uh, on the lookout was for these interesting weirdos who i loved uh, there was this one guy who i well i wasn't sure how he he uh made ends meet but he always had an opinion on something he always had something interesting to say so I, I look forward to seeing him so uh yeah yeah I, there's just something that be being unpredictable uh that makes i think for a really interesting conversation or character in this case yeah and then uh one last uh, meeting of the kids and i, I they haven't quite killed him yet, have they? Or they? No. Uh, they're, they're about this is where the <laughs> the darker turn starts to take hold. <laughs> it's like the, the title tells you what they're going to do, though, so you kind of know all the way along it's coming. Yeah. And then this one, uh, the uh, the Omega Brain, it made me think of a moment of the Omega the Unknown, but uh, it's more of a homage to childhood than anything, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, yeah. That's it. Um, it, yeah. It's sort of a an homage to childhood and to the the just the idea that like the things you love as a kid and how they shape um, how how they shape your life moving forward and how what it's like to return to them and what kind of function that's played at least in my life and I suspect in a lot of people's. But um, yeah, it all is. played out through a lens of sharks and apes fighting each other. <laughs> Is that something that, that uh, you did as a kid? No, um, I was like, so I punched it up a little bit for this. I used to just draw cats and dogs all the time, which I oh, think yeah. is a pretty obvious. So I, <laughs> as a note for my childhood self, like you could have kind of stopped, not stopped with the first idea, you know? So when I, when I wanted to return to it here, I tried to make it a little more interesting. Um, with the sharks and apes kind of evolution of, of those but yeah i used to write and draw um cats and dogs fighting like this sort of thing and like fighter jets and tanks and stuff yeah yeah it makes me think of uh, godzilla versus king kong how that's such a crowd pleaser a reliable yeah. crowd, crowd pleaser yeah they used to see big uh anthropomorphic monsters fight each other it's very reliable yeah. and popular <laughs> Yeah, this is this gets this gets downright surreal. You've got these uh, Trump Trump people who wish they were human again. They're, they're 
this this panel here with the Trump shark looking right at the reader is one of my favorites in the entire in the entire book. Like I like I just love how uh, PJ and and Deerblood did that panel. It was it turned out really well. Yeah. And then they finally uh, do in the bookcase, which is interesting. No, yeah, nothing really dies in comics, you know. Oh yeah, he's he's can pro probably come back to life. And then there's a wonderful uh, examples of your writing, and uh, so you're very uh, very careful in in how you uh, just lay out the scenes for the artists. Yeah, I try to. I mean, I also kind of um, preface all of, all these scripts that I gave to them with like, if you wanted, to, like, these are just ideas. Like the details, like you'll see, like um, in this one, for example, uh, the idea was like a sandwich with flies buzzing around it. But um, I thought that was a to serve as sort of a good starting point because if you'll notice, Anna took it and did something even way funnier, which was kind of a reference to like uh, the pizza rat. <laughs> like you'll see the rat with a little slice of pizza there and then if you notice the oh, pizza yeah, on the yeah. desk like that wasn't that's not the way a human would eat a slice of pizza that was clearly the rat who took a bite out of the pizza that's on his desk <laughs> like, but yeah like I, I try to give without being too prescriptive on like I won't give notes on angle or any on or page layout or anything just kind of list things that might appear in the foreground and background and let them let them kind of exercise their own uh, maybe they're the visual artists right yeah, it's uh, it's so easy to to rom romanticize a, a scene like this. I, I, I like I mentioned to you a, a while a while back that it that when you described it, it, it reminded me of the Night Stalker, that show that in, back in the seventies, and uh, but I guess living it's another thing. It's it's not so romantic if you're actually living, being the no, and reporter. Yeah, it, it, it was romantic before I got there. Like when I took the job, it was like, oh, what an adventure I'm going to embark upon. But it's terrifying. Like you're going to scenes where people have died, where like uh, things are not under control. And like that's that's your job um, right out of college with very little like tools to process things like that at 22, 23, you know, like um, it, it was romantic beforehand and it feels like an adventure now. But in the actual moment, it was very difficult. I guess that's the best way to do it, though, because you, you can't uh, sit on the fence forever contemplating, am I going to be a reporter or not? You just have to jump in at some point. Yeah. Well, at 22, I didn't really think twice about it. Like, I like I think at that age, you don't – you're driven pretty much by hubris. <laughs> like, so, you know, I didn't really think about the implications. I just thought, like, I wanted to go to the most adventurous place possible right out of college, you know, Um and then I found when I got there that I'd had enough of it pretty quickly. So <laughs> I wouldn't do that now, like move to the middle of somewhere I'd never been before and jump into a job like that. Yeah, I, I'm sure that the journalism industry had a, a, a formula that had worked for them many, many times over and over again. And now it's, now it's a bit, bit different, isn't it? It's Oh, yeah, it, it's really true. Like um, I graduated around the recession um, from college and the – the writing was sort of on the wall for local papers, but that that system you're talking about was very much a thing. And like, I had friends who'd go to like Henderson, North Carolina, or um, Battle Creek, Michigan, like these small cities where you kind of you are the night cops reporter. You learn to cut your teeth. You do that for a year or two and move on. And that's kind of how the local papers had functioned for years. I don't know why this is in my on my mind, but I'm thinking of this uh, wonderful. Uh, documentary on Dan Rather. It's on Netflix, I think, right now still. Uh, and uh, I think he, he just loved that that uh, that stage of being a, a reporter. He was always uh, in his heart the cub reporter fighting fighting the, the next battle. If, the, if that resonates with you. Um, a little bit. Like, I think by the time I was a cub reporter, the, like, I think it's really hard to do that sort of reporting like without like the system was already breaking down so like it was less about like finding the next battle to fight and more like am i gonna be laid off next week like that was always the question and like um the company was like going bankrupt in the middle of my time there so there was and there was so you had to give a lot of thought to not like your 
future as a reporter 10 years from now, but just like, what industry would I go into when this all ends? Like, that was a big thing that was kind of weighing on us. Oh, uh, yeah. What was really fun, though, was being in college before you really had to kind of grapple with that, <laughs> working for the college paper. That was great. It was Everything was going to be great at that time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want I, I did this thing where I naturally just took these notes, not thinking I was ever going to do anything with them. But now I'm thinking that it could be interesting to uh, to chat a little bit um, about this. I, as I told you before we started, I I viewed the uh, the thing that Dave did on, on Comic Book Herald with uh, Jonathan Hickman, and it was interesting how both of you guys were so well prepared. It was so smooth. I, I'm just so impressed with, with what he does. I, he wasn't really on my radar. Maybe I don't, I don't know why, but now I wanted to see more of his stuff. And I, I just yeah, he did he, um, yeah, a ahead. whole series of conversations about the, uh, the work of Jonathan Hickman, like book, book by book. Um, and that one we talked about was the, the nightly news. Cause I did have that journalism background. Um, yeah, uh, I think he's scaled back a little bit now, as as a lot of comics journalists have. Um, but yeah, that he's got a few of those series that uh, you. I think it was like a series of YouTube videos um, that he did. They're really interesting. Well, I'll just rattle off the, what I've got in my notes. One thing that you brought up was the fact that uh, yes, uh, it's it's a follow the money, power corrupts theme. But, but the flip side is that the, the alternative, the citizen podcaster, can be just as corrupt, which that that's spot on. And then I think you uh, were thinking, well, the implied solution is an uh, educated and literate uh, consumer, and, and that's uh, we we hope that happens. I, I mean, of course it does, but it, it seems like the mass. It's. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of up in the air. I, I, I don't know where to go with that because I was at Comic Con last year, and the one thing that was interesting to me is a lot of people just admitted they don't read. Period. Yeah, they just don't read. And this one guy said, "Well, science fiction. I, I love Warhammer." And I said, "What? What novel is that? No, that's a game. That's a game." Yeah. So it's interesting, but at the same time, there are readers. But I think it's always going to be a certain uh, amount of readers. And they're, they're a ferocious demographic, but uh, I I don't know how you attract more readers or how you how you cultivate a, a wider readership if that's even possible. That's almost beyond the scope of the creator to to try to create more readers. I know, yeah. Well, that yeah, that is that is something I I I believe like just outside of the context of the Hickman conversation that like the the news is sort of dictated by the demand of the audience to an extent and it's like um the yeah we could go down it's kind of a deep rabbit hole right oh, I know <laughs> like, I think I think uh there was a healthier relationship between the community and its news when before pre-internet like um you could write a letter to the editor to express uh what you're feeling and on the news side the the corporate side didn't have analytics to show like who was reading what articles and like um what what was doing poorly and what wasn't so there was a little bit of more um just uh editorial decision making had uh wasn't you weren't able to poke holes in it um by like saying no one's paying attention to this so we'd kind of continue on with important things like city hall coverage like City Hall coverage is not never going to be something that thousands and thousands upon people will read, but it's important to the people who read it, who might only be reading it for information like uh, about how one member voted on a water uh, utility question and why. Like that there's these kind of important functions that like are never going to um, get tons of people to watch it on TikTok, which is like how a lot of studies show people are increasingly getting their news. Um, it's just a tough thing to talk about without starting to feel pessimistic, to be honest. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, so I, I wonder, because uh, as you, as a, as a comics creator, is that something that you want to pursue? I, I, I get the impression that you're not going to be pursuing that type of subject. You're, you're more interested in the offbeat, uh, uh, supernatural, perhaps, or just the... Yeah. Yeah. Um... 
I I have a sensibility. I think I, I think we were talking about how all these stories are very different, but I think I have sort of a playful sensibility to the way I I approach storytelling. And yeah, like it's not. I like to um, at, like analyze the news in my experience with it, like I did in the first story. But if I'm gonna do that, like it, I I feel this inclination. Like I can only really do it um, by pairing it with something over the top, like a werewolf priest. Otherwise, it starts to feel bogged down and i start to feel like i'm not like if you really want a serious analysis of the news then perhaps reading the new yorker might or something i don't know like might be the better way to go but i i wanted to use comics to to pair it with what i love about comics and the medium which is how it can be pulpy and and maybe um capture get people to think about the news who wouldn't pick up a more serious publication or seek it out that way but it's really not like I definitely didn't set out to write that story or any story with like I have this to say in a serious manner. Like I kind of start it with the um, the funnier, sort of campier, pulpier ideas, and then my like personal um, as I was trying to personalize though like a horror story, my the most one of the scariest experiences in my life started to shape it after I I'd, I'd already gone down that road a little bit, if that makes sense. I don't know. Well, it uh, it makes me think of, of what ended up happening to Rod Serling because he he started writing social commentary and he ended up at some point he decided this is not being uh, received by the by the sponsors. I'm, I'm getting all these all this flack, and so he went into fantasy to to tell his stories. Does that resonate with you? That yeah, absolutely. That um, yeah, a hundred percent. Like I started out uh, as a, like I, my aspirations were very much to be a serious journalist when I was twenty two years old. Like, um, like I wanted to work for the Washington Post or something, um, and like file FOIA requests and investigate government, and that that like that's that was sort of the ambitions I had. And then as I had as I had challenges with that, and I like just didn't enjoy the job and wasn't frankly that great at it it kind of changed and I started writing like very serious literary fiction and I did that for I don't know five seven years um I wrote short stories and things um I had a few of those published but I was kind of not enjoying the the seriousness of that as well like that was still even a little too I would go to readings and things and I and I like to hear what the what the writers had to say but it just felt like everyone involved was maybe taking it a little too seriously. So like, and that's kind of like, as a, as, and I'd always love comic books and had never stopped reading them really. Like uh, I'd, I'd kind of wavered with how many I read in a given year, but I'd never gotten all the way away from it. And then as I, as I got more and more into that, I started drawing a little bit again, uh, not well and, and uh, trying to, to write scripts. And I found that I really, really enjoy the collaborative process and the, the, how comics, I think, have an innate ability to be ridiculous, but also within that ridiculous veneer can take things very seriously and get very strange without without totally alienating the reader in, in um, ways that like literary fiction and, and journalism maybe don't have the ability to do. Once you start to get too strange, people, the audiences for those things kind of check out in a way that I think comics readers don't. Like they're kind of game for anything, which I appreciate. Mm. Well, my uh, rule of thumb is to, to just to not take anything too seriously. Uh, anything in life, <laughs> have a sense of irreverence. I guess not want something too too badly, and then sometimes when you don't want it so badly, it, it comes to you. Yeah, I think that's true. That's really true. Like I've found that. Um, uh, I don't know if it's like superstition, maybe, but it's like when it it's the moment I kind of relax and, and just start kind of doing things for fun and not having like trying to get expect a lot back from it is when any kind of even minor success starts to kind of take shape. I wanted to chat a little bit about the art of writing, uh, specifically a comics review and how you got into it. What, what led you to say, you know, I got to just start writing about comics. Um, I wanted to, learn about the medium and the industry in a serious way like i kind of want i there's two things to it there were, it was kind of like putting myself through a study like to just i feel like uh when you read a book and i i don't know i'd love to hear what you think uh with the intent to review it you read it in a different way um 
in a, in a more serious way and you consider the choices differently. Um, so I wanted to like, when I, when I started my original blog comics book case, the plan was I was going to update it twice a week uh, and just keep, keep myself to like uh, doing the work of two pieces a week, you know, and um, just make myself take comics a little more seriously. Uh, and then I also found once I started doing that, like almost immediately, the people who were making comics were responding to me directly and sharing what I was writing. Like with that, I was I was just putting it out on Twitter and I wasn't really um, didn't have that expectation or anything. But the community seemed really sort of supportive of of that and kind of appreciative of it. Um, so it also felt like a way if I was going to start asking people to to draw my scripts and and buy comics I was making it felt like this was a way to pay dues and kind of give back um and like not just walk in with entitlement like work with me read my read my books but to actually kind of be part of a of a community that seemed pretty interconnected well I, I guess I'm more of a, of a generalist with a natural bent towards uh independent offbeat uh, weird comics uh, comics that you don't normally uh read image comics has now has kind of branded it itself as that alternative even though they're totally a, a huge uh company but uh they they have a, a, just a certain offbeatness about them that uh, as a tr i'm attracted to so a lot of the times and there's a lot of stuff that i, I don't like or i just zone out but a lot of times image Comics is a, a good way to define what I like, and I, I was looking at uh, something that you uh, recommended just this week, a uh, self help, and I, I can see why it it just has those elements. It's it's like a Twilight Zone episode, a, a, a doppelganger element there, and yeah, a, a very crisp storyline. It is something come to mind when when you think of that. Yeah, I liked how I liked how grounded that comic was, um, without like if without um, feeling like it had to. I think sometimes it, I'll I'll read a comic and I'll feel like some the genre stuff like feels like obligatory to an extent. Um, and I guess you'd say that that was a noir comic, um, but yeah, I I liked how really grounded that was and sort of patient it was to like show its hand. And it did remind me of the Twilight Zone. Um, but I'm I'm with you. Like, yeah, I really I look forward to Im image comics and what they're doing. And like like you, like there's quite a bit that I look past. But like, you know, a few a few gems a month is really enough to keep you going as a as a reviewer looking for things to kind of recommend to people. And I on a, a note about you're referring to or comparing or trying to figure out where comics fall into uh, fiction and, and literary fiction. And I think uh, it certainly is something to be taken seriously because I am not prepared right now to start talking about Jonathan Hickman in depth. So there is so much work. Just like a, a, a literary uh, a, a body of work, one, one finds himself having to uh, consider the canon and, and, which I always thought of as something you'd be talking about with Canterbury Tales. This yeah. is like canon, and then I uh -huh. hear it being referred to with Harry Potter, and I think then I, I finally accepted it after a while. <laughs> it's, it's not legitimate to use it that way. Uh, um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I I find that I am capable of writing about a, uh, anything, but I have to do the research, especially like Marvel comics. There's so much backstories and history and it's just that you have to you have to uh, i i mean it's just taking care of uh death of comics bookcase i i had to get in a good frame of mind it helped that i reviewed it already and still i there, there was I, am i missing something i'm missing something last night i, I came across the next door number one for instance and then gold mass was the only one i said am i am i ready to talk about that one because i <laughs> It, it yeah, hadn't, it, I hadn't had time to uh, to process it completely. I guess. Yeah, I think that one um, it helps if you read if you, like Terry Pratchett fantasy novels, and then also I think playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, a lot w would bring the the more Dungeons and Dragons you played, the more you probably chuckle at that one. <laughs> it's probably directly yeah. proportional. 
Well, I have to admit, I have not really read as much of Terry Pratchett. I, I, I mean to, I, 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 I mentioned so many writers in, in my graphic novel, George's one. I, I don't mention Terry Pratchett, but I think George had mentioned him. And there's so many things he mentioned offhand that I just, I, I, I gathered as many as I could, but there's all, there was all, all these little nuggets that I, maybe that's for another book. No, I, I would be, I mean, yeah, I'd be shocked if George wasn't um, intimately familiar with Terry Pratchett's work. I mean, I feel like they have a similar sensibility um, mm -hmm. and just kind of a uh, old school rank, rankator, rank, rankator. I get, I always mispronounce that word. <laughs> rankator. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and your, yeah, your book, um, it was such a joy to write about. I, I just feel like, uh, and, it, uh, and you mentioned the serendipity to it. Like, it, like I think we discovered in chatting that I, um, when I was at community college in Illinois years ago, uh, one of my classes was was taught by uh, a protege of George's or a friend, and George had actually um, called into my class to like just talk to us about having worked on the Twilight Zone and everything. And I hadn't thought about that in many years, and then as I was in the process of uh, learning, as your book found its way to me, I Googled it and, and figured out that it was the same, the same writer who'd spoke to my class those years ago, and it just felt serendipitous. And then when I actually read the book, there was a little bit about serendipity in it as well. Um, so I don't know, just a series of neat coincidences that, that I found very inspiring <laughs> through this oh, process. I know. <laughs> well, I uh, I hope I've done justice to. Uh, uh giving people a sense of, of your book. I guess the, the big question right now to, to ask you in public is uh, how will this book become available to the general public? Or are you still working those uh, details out? No, I have a plan. Um, right now I'm kind of deep in the process of fulfillment. Like I finally got the uh, uh, full print run um, to my house last week. And so like, I, I'm just like, as you could kind of see here a little bit swimming in cardboard <laughs> at the moment with all this. And so like by the, in the next couple of weeks, it'll go out and then I'll be actually uh, tabling at Baltimore Comic-Con uh, in September, which will be like the debut um, where you can buy it uh, to the public. And then after that, uh, in the fall, I'll have a web store set up at comicsbookcase.com where if you missed the Kickstarter and you're not local or able to attend Baltimore, it'll be available online there. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the plan. So it's kind of exclusive to backers throughout the summer. Uh, I'll be tabling with it at Baltimore and then um, likely sometime in October it'll be available online at comicsbookcase.com. Well that, that's a, a perfect way to, to to end the interview. I, I would just say to uh anyone who's interested in doing what you're doing that uh you 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 created a perfect uh, roadmap so people just need to uh, look back at your blog comics uh, a bookcase and then get the book get the, the death of comics bookcase volume one and start connecting the dots and then go to a comic uh go to your local comics convention wherever it is and uh go from there yeah, I think that's about that about that about sums it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Zach. Well, I w I will be at San Diego Comic Con, and uh, I think you're going to be there too. So we'll, we'll probably uh, meet up there. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to it. It'll be it'll be fun to catch up. <laughs>